service because you know we have you know, that many locations. So when you write programs, okay, do you guys have a question? Question? No? Okay. So from the perspective of your uh, program and your instruction, everything is quote unquote linear. It goes from zero to 2047. Now the question is, if that is what your program, your instruction is seeing, how do I figure out you know, which one of these memory chips contains the byte that I want to access? Read or write doesn't matter. Well, the translation in this case is very simple, okay? Because as a, as a CPU, you know, part of the CPU is called the MMU, or Memory Management Unit. Um, it started off as something that's really, really simple, but these days, you know, they can get very complicated. So the MMU can be programmed to remember, oh, the first memory chip, you know, chip zero, will contain logical location zero to 511. Chip number two will pick up from 512 to 10,023, 10,024 to 10,056. I cannot add numbers quickly. 10,024 plus 511. 1526. And then the last uh, 512 bytes. <laughs> but you guys get the idea, right? The MMU understands how it is mapped. How to map from logical location to physical location. Physical location meaning which memory chip contains which range of addresses from the logical standpoint. Okay? So that part is important. I kind of you know, did not mention that last time. All right. So if I want to perform a memory write cycle, now when we talk about memory write and memory read, we are looking at things from the perspective of the processor, okay, which is also seen from the perspective of the instructions that you'll be writing in this class. A memory write cycle is going to write to memory from the processor. The first thing we have to do is the processor, or the MMU of the processor, will first compute the chip number and the address on the chip. Okay? So I, can, I have to figure out which chip I have to be using and what is the address on that chip that I'll be addressing. And then the second thing that we'll do, as soon as I figure that out, I will quote unquote latch the address on the address bus. In other words, I will spell out the location on the address bus using zeros and ones. All four chips will, it will be able to see what I'm latching onto the address bus because it's a quote unquote broadcast kind of bus. I will specify whether it is read or you know, write. In this case, you know, I'm using a low signal to mean a write, uh, to mean it is a write operation. This can easily flip the other, the other way around. It, it is just a convention that we use um, a low to specify a write and a high to specify a read. In this case, it's a write cycle. I will, as a processor, I will also latch the new content of that location onto the data lines. So at this point, you know, the, data, the address lines are driven by the processor. The data lines are driven by the processor as well. So all of those lines you know, now have specific voltages, as well as the read-write line. Step number five seems to be the end of everything, and the seems to be the end of the entire step, but that's really not the end of the entire step. So let's say you know, I select you know, the second chip, okay, chip number one to, um, to address. Okay? You contain the location that my instruction wants to access. So at this point, I will assert the chip select line only going to this particular chip. So all the other three chips will ignore everything that is on the address bus and also on the address bus. And on the address bus and also on the data bus because they are not selected. So you are the only one selected, so now you will have to perform the other steps following number five. The next step, once I assert the chip select line, this is this cannot be observed from the outside. Okay? In other words, the memory chip itself will now say, okay, I am the one selected because my chip select line is asserted. And as a result, at this point, the memory chip will sample, it will read or sense the address lines to determine which location to connect the data lines to. The data line you know, is still driven, but the first step is for the memory chip itself to internally switch the pathway from the data lines to its memory locations. 
Okay, so this will incur a little bit of a delay because you know in order to switch internally, you know, to make the uh, connection from the data lines, which are the pins on the outside, to the internal location, it takes a little bit of time. And this part cannot be observed. Once the um, internal pathway is uh, set, has settled down, the memory chip will now connect the data line to the location specified, which means you know they are now connected. And then the next thing is the specified location will be overwritten by the content on the data line itself. Okay. In other words, you know, you will be busy copying whatever is on the data line, you know, on the page that I specified. How much this time, how much time this will consume depends on the chip, depends on the transistor size, depends on a lot of factors. Okay, but the delay depends physically on the chip itself. And also, this one cannot be observed because all of these steps are occurring inside the memory chip, the processor cannot say, oh, okay, you are done with this step, you're done with this step, you're done with this step. The processor is just going like, okay, I'm just going to wait here. Okay, and we'll talk about you know, what I mean by waiting. The MMU will wait for a fixed amount of time, and then it will release the chip select line, and then it will stop driving the data lines, and then it will also stop driving the address lines, and this is the completion of a memory cycle. So the key here is how much time should I wait as a processor before I start the next memory cycle to give the memory chip enough time to you know, overwrite that location. That really is the question. Okay. A lot of that depends on the chip. Um, how many people have bought a memory you know, DIMM recently? How do, you spe how do they specify the speed of those memory modules? Megahertz. Hmm? Megahertz. Megahertz. We get the operating frequency, and then they also have their latency. The latency. Exactly. The latency is the time that I have to wait. Okay. Now, in this case, there's one single latency for write. Okay. Because I'm. This is not DDR, you know, type of operation. The DDR operation has internal cycles, and therefore there are additional latencies you know, that have to be specified. If you have a slow memory chip. This amount of time has to be longer. If you have a faster memory chip, you can you know, shorten the time. Okay. What if you have a slow memory chip and just you don't specify enough time? Well, first of all, okay, let me ask this question. With only this type of instruction specified, do you think the processor can tell, is there any type of handshake for the processor to know that, oh, you're not quite done yet, okay, you know, I'll just wait a little bit longer and tell me when you're done. There's no handshake, okay? That's called handshaking, okay? With full handshaking, it means the processor will basically say, okay, I'm going to tell you to start operation now. And, but on the other hand, I'm sensing this particular line, this particular um, trace. So when you are done, you will assert you know, this done flag so that I know when I can start the next memory cycle. This has no handshaking, which means it is all completely based on timing. If a memory chip does not have enough time to complete the operation, and then the data line you know, switches or you know, it's not driven anymore, it is possible that the memory chip will write the wrong item or the wrong, um, data, the wrong bits to the location. So then you will start, up, you'll start to have your know, memory corruption because the content of memory is no longer what the processor specifies. Okay? And then your program will probably crash because if you have uh, memory corruption in the instruction space of the kernel, then the kernel will try to execute illegal instructions, which will cause um, a, uh, a fault. But at that point, there's no operating system to come to its rescue and say, oh, you know what, you know, application program, that is not a good instruction to execute. I will just you know, terminate this execution and print your know, segmentation fault on the screen. There's no, no one to rescue because you are the last defense. Okay, so what you will see is the entire system will just crash. Um, it will stop working altogether. In some cases, it will reboot depending on whether you have any watchdog you know, set up and stuff like that. Okay, so not a good thing. Not specifying enough latency, you know, for you know slower chips is definitely not a good thing. All right, memory recycle is almost the same. The first few steps are 
almost exactly the same, except for a few steps. Okay, <coughs> first of all, the MMU, you know, the processor, has to compute the chip number and the address on the chip. Okay, that part is the same. Um, the address still has to be latched on the address lines. In other words, I have to tell the memory chip which, what is the address on the chip that I want to access. Now this time, the, oh, the difference is as a processor, I'm leaving the data lines floating, quote unquote floating, which means I'm not driving the data lines. Okay? I'm not specifying you know, this data line has to be a high, low, high, high. I'm just saying whatever. Okay? I'm just leaving it floating, which means someone else can now drive those lines. Okay? The read-write line is high in this case. It, is, it was low before, and this time it has to be high to specify a read operation. And then I will assert the chip select line on the chip that I want to access, that I want to read from. So at that point, the memory chip will understand, OK, I'm the one selected, and this is a read operation. So what happens next is the selected memory chip will sample the address lines so that it can understand, OK, which location on this particular chip you know, do we want to access? That would take a certain, a certain amount of time. The selected location of the memory chip, the selected location of the selected memory chip will now connect to the data line, which means at this point, the um, memory chip will drive the data lines. Okay, the content of that location will now be specified and observable on the data lines. Zeros is a, zero is a low, one is a high, so you can actually use an oscilloscope or a logic analyzer to see that pattern on the data bus. <coughs> But as far as the processor is concerned, it doesn't know when the data is ready, okay? Because it might take you know, 20 nanoseconds, it might take 30 nanoseconds, it might take 45 nanoseconds. So to be sure, what the processor will do is it will say, okay, I will just wait whatever, however long is safe to, you know, to wait at least that long. So it might wait 60 nanoseconds, okay? So it will wait 60 nanoseconds before the processor samples the data line and say, oh, okay, so that is the data that I'm supposed to get, that I'm supposed to read back from the memory chip. When that part is done, the processor will then release the chip select line, which means it is going to deassert um, the chip select line. The memory chip will now go back to its sleeping state. You know, it will not drive the data line anymore. The data line goes back to uh, what we call high impedance mode. The, the selected memory chip will stop, okay, you know, that's what I just said. The address lines are now not driven by the MMU anymore because it is no longer needed and the entire memory cycle is completed. Do we have any questions about this? Does it kind of make sense logically or is it not really logical? It's okay? okay. Um, for those of you who want to become, or currently already are, computer engineers and electrical engineers, but with a tendency to do digital design, um, this stuff here can be visualized as a timing diagram. Okay, I'm not showing a di timing diagram here because it, it actually can be a little bit confusing. Instead of steps one, two, three, four, you will see you know arrows pointing everywhere because you know, this trigger or this falling edge can trigger this event and so on. So I'm just using you know, a step-by-step you know, -step, uh, description here instead of using a timing diagram because sometimes you know, that may not help as much. Do we have any questions?